Lesson number three. Don't assume that you know who the good guys and the bad guys are. This is a highly polarized country, and I work in a highly polarized town, and many people at the polls are very sure that they have cornered the market on virtue and truth. This work is easier, life is easier with that kind of certainty, when you know who wears the black hats and who wears the white hats and there's not a lot of gray. Don't be so sure. Another story from my adventures of the last year. The day the immigration bill went down, I was in the lobby of the Senate with a group of immigrant day laborers. They were there to speak to senators on their way in to vote. Several senators who framed themselves as our allies saw us coming and deliberately looked the other way to avoid having to have a conversation with us. One senator came and spoke to the men and told them this, I'm going to vote with you, and then the vote's going to go badly, and I'm going to change my vote and vote against you. And that's exactly what he did. But to his credit, when the vote was done and the other senators were slinking out the other doors so that they wouldn't have to look at us, he came back and he told us, it happened as, it's, as I said it would. You've lost, and I voted against you. And then he said an extraordinary thing. He said, I get it that this is a profile in cowardice, but the country isn't ready to do the right thing yet. I have a lot more respect for a senator who will tell the truth that you don't want to hear than the one who avoids you, but is going to send a press release later in the day telling the world how much he was on your side. The senator in question is someone that I agree with fairly rarely on policy. But if I put him in the bad guy column, I give up any chance of having a conversation or getting his vote. The fact of the matter is he's not a bad guy. He's a guy I disagree with sometimes. But in his heart, he's trying to move the country forward just as I am. And by loosening up on my own prejudices, I open the door to having a conversation. And I promise you, eventually, I'm getting his vote. <laughs> if I could do this, I'm going to give you another example from the intense experience of the last few weeks. Some of you know that the last year has been an intense one for me for a reason beyond my work. I came to Michigan last year both to spend time with you at the Ford School and also to spend time with my mother, who was fighting a losing battle with cancer. She lost that battle this week. My parents live not far from here, in Livonia. And if you look at the demographics of the area where they live and do sort of an analysis of voting patterns, it's pretty safe to assume that many of my parents' neighbors aren't wild about Latinos and aren't wild about immigrants. A demographic analysis and survey data will tell you that some of them are probably devotees of the television programs that vilify my organization, my field of work, and my community pretty much every day. Voting patterns and demographic analysis suggest that some of my parents' neighbors are on one side of the red versus blue America debate, and that's a side which one side sees as your base and the other side sees as the enemy. But I'll tell you what, as we were sitting by my mother's bedside in vigil, they kept bringing us food with tears in their eyes. Surely we could do better than operate in a political climate which divides our neighbors into friends and enemies. So don't assume that you know who the good guys and the bad guys are. Lesson number four, beware of velocity. This work has changed so much in the 20 plus years I've been doing it, and the single biggest reason is technology. It is totally amazing how much information we have access to, how well connected we can be, how efficient. During my time here at the Ford School, I was stunned at the luxury that you have that I don't have in my work. And that is time to think. You'd be shocked, or maybe not so shocked, at how little thinking goes on in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> this work moves literally at the speed of light. And it enhances your ability to work well, except when it doesn't. It's too easy to be in work mode all the time. And the policy world, especially in Washington, is full of people who mistake all of that activity, all of that being busy, all of that being connected with being effective and being important. Don't make that mistake. In our line of work, there's a lot of cachet to working hard, working late, working weekends, working all the time. And it is wonderful, engaging, exciting, important work. But the more we glorify simply being busy, active, connected, the more we crowd out time to read, write, and think. So 
So I'm going to give you a little barometer of when you've gone over the line. If you don't have one already, you're going to have a little electronic device that you're going to wear and you're going to carry in your pocket or purse all the time. So if you reach for it, A, on a date, B, in the bathroom, C, on your bedside table when you're up at 2 o'clock in the morning, you need to stop. Find your device's off switch, find your off switch, and activate it. Work hard, I know you will, but don't work so hard that you lose yourself in the process. If my mother were here, and she's here in spirit, she would tell you that in order to do well the work of your heart, you have to give that heart care and attention. Remember to have a life, to engage in the things that give it depth and meaning. Work hard, but grow a garden or some children. Read a novel, or better yet, a book of poetry. Listen to music at least, maybe make music. Mom would tell you to make sure you take time every day to really love the people you love. Lesson number five. Remember why you went into this work in the first place. I have yet to meet a single person who went into public policy for anything other than noble reasons. You are entering the field of public service with great skills at your disposal, well-trained in a premier institution, and part of a community of smart, committed, and really nice people at the Ford School. You're doing it at an incredible moment in which Americans are showing a fervor for the democratic process unlike anything we've seen for at least a generation. The number of people turning out for political rallies or primaries is setting records all around the country. Most exciting, the enthusiasm of young people for the political process is undercutting all of that conventional wisdom that says that young Americans are too apathetic to do what they can do to change the country and the world. America is hungry for something. And the thing we are hungry for is the thing that you just spent a few years equipping yourselves to provide. We need you for the long haul. Think today about why you got yourselves here and remember it. Make the country a better place and make yourselves better along with it. To your parents, partners, friends, and family, I know this day is about the graduates and their achievements, but you've had something to do with it too. Congratulations on getting them this far. You are the people who've launched them, sustained them, dried tears, calmed panic attacks, poured the coffee after the all-nighters. Let me take advantage of the fact that my own family is here and say to them, and to you on behalf of your graduates, we couldn't be who we are or do what we do without you. Thank you. To the faculty and staff of the Ford School, you are really talented, really wonderful, really special people. Thank you for what you do and for what you've done for these students. And finally, to the class of 2008, wow, what a moment, what an accomplishment, what an incredible time to be launching a career in the service of your community, our country, our planet. We need you. I can't wait to see what you'll do. Congratulations.